Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This is a community supported podcast made possible by donors and patrons like you. You can help the podcast grow by subscribing to it, leaving a review and a rating and by spreading the word wherever you can. You can also support by becoming a donor or a patron and receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. You can find out more at loveandcourage.org. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot and is hugely appreciated. I hope you enjoy the podcast. And what is pure freedom is, and I hope I'm allowed to say a little curse here, but I don't care, I don't give a shit what people think of me anymore. I really don't, and I really mean that. Whereas at one time, I would have been so stuck in that feeling of what are people going to think? It was just, and I think now it's some kind of like toxic shame or something that we carry you know that we feel we have to live up to this kind of expectation of what people or how people perceive us or maybe we can't live up to our own expectations I really don't know but you know and I've learned now that really I am who I am you know and this is it this is just it and if people like me they like me but not everybody's going to like me my guest in this episode is Francis Black Francis is a well-known Irish singer, campaigner, politician, addiction counsellor and social entrepreneur. She achieved fame early in her life as part of Irish folk supergroup Arcady and then later with her family in the band The Black Family. She featured on the renowned Woman's Heart album which became the biggest selling Irish album of all time. Francis has recorded a total of 10 solo albums to date and has toured the world including the US, New Zealand and even Iraq. Frances battled with alcohol dependency in her 20s and went on to become an addiction counsellor before setting up the RISE Foundation in 2009 to support families affected by various forms of addiction. In 2016, Frances surprised many when she entered the world of politics and was elected as an independent senator. I absolutely loved hearing Frances's fascinating life story when we met in her office in Leinster House. And so without further ado, here's my interview with the lovely Frances Black. Francis, thanks very much for joining me on the Love and Courage podcast. I want to start by uh, talking about your mother, if you don't mind, because I've just walked into your office here in Leinster House and uh, she just jumped out at me. And uh, you're just after saying she'd be laughing yeah. at the thought you'd been she in here. She would have been laughing. The first thing I did when I got in here was I brought in her picture. Um, and it's that picture of her there where she's sitting with her arms folded in her red cardigan and uh, she just has a big smile on her face and you know I suppose when I got in here when I got when I got elected into Leinster House into the Shannon I you know I would have I just kept thinking of my parents and they they came from inner city Dublin from the tenement houses in Charlemont Street and um, when my father came from Rattlin Island which is off North Antrim a small island off North Antrim but my mother came from the Liberties um, and they both you know, moved into a one-roomed house, you know, a one-roomed flat in a tenement house when they got married back in the 40s. And um, and that's where we were born and reared. And it's not too far from here. Like, it's Chairman Street. It's just up Harcourt Street and around the corner. And, you know, that's where all the tenement houses were. And, you know, my brother Martin often says to me, imagine, Fran, when we were kids and sitting around the table and, you know, us all having dinner and, you know, living in the tenements did we ever think that you would be a senator in, you know, Leinster House? Who would have thought? So, you know, I, I look at that picture sometimes and I think, well, man, what do you think, you know? And me dad, I know he would have been thrilled to, as well, you know. They would have been both very proud, no doubt about it. Were you it. born in that house? You yeah. Didn't, yeah. We were all born in, and reared in Charman Street. Um, and it was a, a fantastic place to be reared, you know. I mean, as I say, it was, a, you know... The house that we lived in was was a house. There was um, it was a tenement house. There was about there was three floors, right? Yeah, three floors, and on each floor in each room there would be about three rooms. There would be a family, right? And it was the same upstairs, um, and downstairs there was an old woman, um, and um, but next door it was a little bit bigger the house, and I I think somehow it. I don't know, there seemed, the families there seemed to be a little bit less, worse off than we were for some reason. And 
but there was millions of kids. Each family had about 10 kids, so they were really hanging out with the rafters, you know, and in each room there was about 10 kids, so next door was like, but we great fun. What, great. what decade was this now? This would have been, for me, I was born in the 60s. Okay. So this was in yeah. the 60s. Wow. And it was in, like, that all kind of ended throughout that 10-year period. So what happened was my father then, um, he started to rent out more rooms in our house, and then when the family upstairs moved out, my father rented those rooms. So we got bedrooms and things like that. Um, and then he rented out, there was a little shop uh, in the building as well. So we were kind of over a shop. And uh, he rented out the shop and he set up a little, when I was about 10, they opened up a little grocery shop and they kind of became, you know, small time business people. But, you know, and they were the local, the yeah. small local shop on Charlemagne Street. Yeah. And, and was it hard times growing up? Yeah, it was hard times. I mean, I know... I remember my mother in particular, like my father, wherever he would get work, he was a plasterer and wherever he would get work, he would go. So if he might go down the country or whatever, but I know that was that wasn't that often that he would get work, you know. Um, but I often remember her waking up with that anxiety within her around, where am I going to get food today for the kids, you know. Um, and she was she had tick from Mrs. Sinnott and Mrs. Lawler, who were the two shops up the road. So you'd get tick, you know? Do you know where you'd credit, get yeah. credit? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, she could get, you know, the food. But we we lived very frugally, really, do you know? Um, and it was only when they opened up the shop and they got a loan of, you know, 300 euro from the credit union, which was a phenomenal amount of money, to get stock. And my father would have done all of the preparing, you know, getting the shop ready, putting up the shelves, clean. My mother was great, cleaning and painting and all that. They did all that up. And they got 300 euro from the credit union and uh, they just bought a few bits and pieces and that's what they did. That's how it all started for them. That would have been in the early 70s. So, and after that we didn't go hungry because there was always food in the shop. Do you know what I mean? There was always bread and cheese and lovely food, chops and, you know. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was the one thing I suppose that my mother, even though she really did, Go. I think she particularly went to hard times because I think she would have had... Those days, the women had a lot of the responsibility of everything, you know, um, and she used to worry a lot and she was anxious. And so um, I, I know that singing brought her joy, you know. She loved singing. And before she met my father, she would have been... Um, she loved going to the dances, you know. And in those days, it would have been kind of old time ballroom type dancing. And the band then at halftime would ask my mother to get up and sing when they took their break. And she'd get up and she'd love it. Like, you know, she just loved singing, you know. So she knew all the old music hall type songs, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd say it was tough time, time for her, definitely. You know, I don't know if my father would have been as impacted and I wouldn't have had yeah. as much responsibility. She would have looked on him as one of her kids. Do you know that way? That's just the way it was. Yeah. You know, yeah. he was just another one of her responsibilities. Yeah, that's yeah. the way it was. So she must have been very resilient to She then? was an amazing, yeah. an so amazing when we, we talk about mental health a lot these days mm. and how to mind yourself and think positive thoughts. But I often think that previous generations, well, they had mental health issues oh, now too. Yeah. and. Um, they were some tough cookies too. They were. Yeah. They were. And I think, I often, when I think back, I often think my mother would have suffered at times with depression and anxiety and stress and worry. Yeah. You know, but she she did. She she got through it and yeah. she made sure she got through yeah, it. And she yeah. just kept going. Great resilience, you know. Yeah. On that subject of depression, obviously, like mental health is a big part of work. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about depression and more and more we have uh, great kind of role models, people that are coming out speaking about depression. Even Bruce Springsteen was talking about yeah. it. But I'm sort of thinking, like, really, is depression, I know there's a spectrum and a scale, but is it not something that we all go through at some level, yeah. at some point in our life? It's, and I've come to think of it as a depression rather than depression that you have forever. And oh. again, I don't want to dispute somebody's experience of mm. what, how they have depression, yeah. How do you feel about it? I mean, you know, I do think a lot of people go through, at some point in their lives, a very dark time. I'd say most people do go through a very... You have to. There's no one escapes grief, you know, and it's how then you can... And whatever that... Or trauma, or whether it's an emotional trauma, you know, and maybe it's an old childhood trauma, 
Um, it could be, you know, lack of maybe work, you know. I mean, it could be so many different things or not going down the right path that we want to go, you know. Um, it can be triggered by so many different things. And I think, I think the biggest challenge that people face is learning how to verbalise what's going on for them. And I think we don't know how to verbalise. We don't have the, you know, that knowledge. I'm only, and I can only talk about myself and when I went through my dark times, I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know where to go and I didn't know how to put a name on it. And I certainly didn't know how to put a name on what I was feeling and the emotions that I was feeling and the horrendous dark, that darkness that, that's within. Um, so did you share with anybody? I didn't because I didn't know, you know, I thought I was just weird. You know, I thought I was different. I thought I was the only one going through it all. You For know, what period of time are you talking about? Well, I would have been on and off all my life, I suppose, you know. And I suppose it's only in the last probably, I suppose, 15 years or maybe even less, 12 years, where I got an understanding as to how to cope with it and I, 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 I really went out of my way to learn the tools to cope with it and I think that's always a challenge but overall from the time I was a very young child I think I would have went through periods of low self-esteem never never really living up to never measuring up you know never feeling good enough never feeling part of which I think a lot of people it's that disconnect isn't it um, you know, and always feeling on the outside, you know, um, and that would have been from a very young age, you know, and it would have come, you know, at different times in my life. The children were, when I had my children, I had both, had my son when I was 19, I had my daughter when I was 21, and they brought so much light into my life. I mean, they really did. They really did. But I have no doubt throughout their childhood, I would have had dips, you know, I would have went down and came back up again, you know. So... And throughout that process, I would have used alcohol, you know, for, for certainly a period of time to numb out, thinking that that was going to help. But it didn't. It actually magnified the problems, you know. So, and, and I, I'll say that again, alcohol magnified the problems. It really, really did. Because that's what it does. Alcohol is a depressant. So, thankfully, I learned that quite quickly. I wasn't aware that it was alcohol, you know, that was making me feel darker, that was making things worse. I wasn't aware of it at the time. Um, but when I did, I made sure that I wasn't going to be dependent on it and it wasn't going to be the one thing that makes me powerless. So I suppose that's uh, that, was a, that was a fantastic was, eye opener. Was this socially acceptable drinking? Or, or was this drinking that would have been seen yeah. as a problem? Yeah, well, I would. Don't get me wrong. I would have been a heavy drinker, but in hindsight, when when I see now what drinking is today, it would have been the same. So, my drinking would have been the bottle of wine a night, you know. Um. So the kids go to bed. You, you manage to get a few bob together, and it wouldn't have been every night because I wouldn't have had much money at the time. I had very little money because I was separated. You know, I was on my own with two kids, you know, marriage had broken up. I was on my own. I was trying to just get by. Um, and, you know, Thursday you'd get your pay or your wages. And I was working at the time, I was working in a little coffee shop. Uh, I was working in Ricardo's snooker hall and I was running the coffee shop, you know. And I loved the job because it really gave me a sense of, I said, I don't know, just a sense of um, connection. You know, I was starting to, I was so crippled with shyness, which you believe, excuse me, I was so crippled with shyness that it was when I started to work in Ricardo's that I started to come out myself a little bit and connect with people and all of that. And that was brilliant for me. But it, I had a broken marriage behind me and um, get paid of a Thursday and you get your cheapest bottle of wine that you can possibly get and you go home and you get the kids their dinner and all of that kind of stuff and they go to bed and then you'd have your bottle of wine but that became I became so preoccupied with what time I was going to put the kids to bed earlier and you know and I was really looking forward to just that feeling of numbing out so as I didn't have to feel feelings um, and then you know the kids would go and stay with their dad the weekend and I'd go on the tear you know um, you know, and that was my pattern of drinking. So it's a classic case of self-medication in a way. Absolutely, 
and I I remember sitting one night and on the, sitting on the couch at home and I think I had a, a, a glass of wine in my hand and I was looking at it and I was thinking I, I don't really want this and then there was this voice going but don't have it but I could not have it I had to have it so that was a big eye opener what, why did you have that drink and you didn't want it but you still drank it because it was like as if this voice was saying it'll help you sleep it'll calm you down you know there was all that little strange negative voice going on in my head so I, I remember reading an article um, that was written in the Irish Times by a journalist who who talked about her drinking pattern um, and it was the same as mine she was a really successful journalist but when she'd come home in the evening she'd go straight to the gin and tonic she'd have a gin and tonic and then she'd have a bottle of wine with her dinner and then she'd have another gin and tonic before she got to bed and it turned out that she actually had a problem and she went to Stanhope Street and I didn't even have the gin and tonic if you know what I mean but I knew there was something not right that I had to have this bottle of wine so I rang up Stanhope Street and I said, look, I don't really want, I don't think I have a problem with alcohol, but I said, I do want to find a way of, of, of not letting it, how, how can I say this, but not giving it my power. Do you know what I mean? Or not letting it take my power. I couldn't understand that. I knew there was something not right with that. So I went and I, I, I got the appointment and I sat down in front of the therapist and she gave me this sheet of paper and I answered the question as honestly as I possibly could and she said to me at the end of it when she read it and you could have knocked me down a feather she said I've no doubt Francis you're an alcoholic and I was absolutely shocked because I didn't see I didn't see my drinking any different to anybody else's I swear I said honest to God like and even when I said it to people people go you don't have a problem with alcohol you know what I'm saying because people think that somebody with a Somebody that has an alcohol problem or is an alcoholic is the wino falling around the street yeah, yeah. or the woman reaching out or the man reaching out for the bottle of whiskey or the bottle of vodka first thing in the morning. And that wasn't my drinking. I was a very functioning person. You know, I would go to work, I'd get the kids, pick up the kids from school and I would get them home, get them their dinner and get do their homework. And they were very young at the time. So... You know, so I was able to do all that, but my drinking would have been in the evening time. Was there an additional challenge in being a single mother in that? Well, obviously there was mm. in, in the sense of, like, I'm also curious around that um, in the particular time and age. I think, thankfully, a lot has changed in Ireland now. Yeah. But was there any stigma there well, as the well other, as the practical the other thing, The other thing about that, just before I actually stopped drinking, um, about a year before that, I had met this wonderful man from Cork. And that was another thing that kind of, um, I suppose, inspired me to go and see about my drinking because he wasn't a drinker at all. And I knew that my preoccupation with alcohol was bothering him and I was worried I would lose him. He was a really good man um, and the kids adored him. And so that was another thing that inspired me to go and, and, and see if I could find out what was going on with me and why I had to have this alcohol. So that was one of the things. So I was I was in a relationship when I stopped drinking for about it was actually probably two years actually I was in a relationship. Um but what was great was that when I started the programme in Stanhope Street, which was three nights a week, my mother, who lived next door to me, babysat. And when I said to her, Mom, I have an alcohol problem, she was surprised as well, because in her head she was thinking it's you know, somebody who reaches out for the bottle. She goes, well, did you drink vodka? Did you drink whiskey and all that? And I said, no, it's just wine. But she was brilliant. And she, they were so, my family were so supportive. It was fantastic. So I embarked on this journey in Stanhope Street. And I was there for a year. And it was incredible. I learned so much. I learned so much about the impact of alcohol, not only on me, not only on my relationship, but also on my children. And I think that was a big shocker. Because my children, who would have been about eight and six at the time, where um, I thought I wasn't, an, I didn't have an impact on them because I wouldn't drink until they were gone to bed. Now sometimes it may be of a Saturday, I might bring them into the pub if I was meeting a friend, do you know. Um, but I was shocked at the way they talked about the, the impact, and that really spurred me on to not drink as well. So that was a real big eye opener for me. So you, you obviously had a lot of good support from within the family, particularly mm -hmm. your mother. 
my mother and my sister. Yeah. Mary was fantastic as well. And, you know, especially with the kids and stuff like that. Um, and then Brian, my partner. So um, I was blessed. Can I ask also that around, I mean, obviously music has been a, an early influence mm. in your life, um, but it, it also is an occupation. Drinking is an occupational hazard in the, in the music mm. realm, mm. more so than it is in most jobs. Yeah. Although there's a fair bit of it going on here in Leinster House as well. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if we'll get to talk about that, but that's that's definitely something to, that needs attention. Um, yeah, so so was there a connection between the music and the lifestyle? Funnily enough, there wasn't. Um, so um, when I finished, just as I started the Stanhope Street programme, <clears throat> I was asked to join the band Arcady. Up to that point, I hadn't really done much singing apart from I had made an album with my family, my, my sister and my three brothers and uh, we had toured that once or twice but there was very little happening around that so and I really loved uh, the performance side of things but it wasn't something there but uh, I, we, the Black family were performing in Galway and um, Johnny McDonough who was the Baron he had been working with Day Dannon which is a traditional band back in the mega and he had left the band and he was setting up a new band and he contacted me and said would you consider joining the band? Sharon Shannon would have been in the band and Sean Keane and Carl Hayden. It was a super group. It was a bit of a super yeah, group. Yeah. So um, he, he said he'd wait. I said, well, I'm embarked on this programme. So, and he said he'd wait for me. So that was brilliant. So the following year, or that year maybe, we started to rehearse and stuff like that, but we couldn't actually go touring. Um, and it, that was when my music career started. So I, I joined Arcady and uh, we made an album and... It done really, really well, and as a result, we travelled the length and breadth of America. We went to all all over the world. We we travelled. One of the most interesting places was Iraq, back in nineteen ninety, um, where we performed in a temple in a in Babylon, and this temple was out in the middle of the desert. I mean, it was just beyond beyond. It was an amazing, incredible experience, and it was really interesting because um, Arcady were performing Irish traditional music. And all the men came in, and they would sit in the in the pews in the, and the women all came in after the men had seated and stood at the back. That was something that was very different, I think, that I had never seen before. So, um, or maybe I did in Kerry or somewhere. <laughs> but um, not picking on Kerry. Yeah, no one messing. But um, so, like, you know, it was it was amazing, and uh, yeah, a fantastic time I had, and I made great friends in the band Arcady. And then when I when I finished with Arcady, I, I decided to not work with Arcady because they were touring so much and I was missing the kids. The kids were still young. And so um, I teamed up with Kieran Goss then, myself and Kieran got together and um, we released an album. Um, we were doing support to my sister Mary in Belfast and we were spotted by a record company there and they offered us an album when we did it and that did really well. I mean, look, I, sometimes I think how to... You know, because we were all doing everything for the crack. Like, yeah. I look at my daughter now and I see how hard she works to try yeah. and make it in the industry. Yeah. And we were just having a laugh. Well, can, can we talk about that for a minute? Because these days there's a lot of emphasis on goal setting and having your vision, mm. your mission, your mm. purpose, your goals. And I think a lot of that is great, to be honest. But sometimes you need to let go of all that yeah. and just be in it, whatever it is you're doing, whether it be yeah. sport or politics yeah. or music. Or go with the flow. And the magic can happen anyway. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And I never know to this day how I ended up in the music industry. I really don't know how it all happened. And I had no intentions because obviously Mary, from a very young age, was, you know, incredible. Like, she had an, an amazing voice and still has an amazing voice. So... Everything was like, you know, going to be, Mary was going to go into the music industry. She was, from a very young age, she was performing all the time. And I never performed and I never, like, you know, I, I didn't even think I was a good singer. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, because you're comparing yourself to an amazing singer. Do you know what I'm saying? And like, Mary was and is incredible. So like, you wouldn't kind of, you just think, nah, that's not going to happen. But then all of a sudden it started to happen and it was great crack and it was great fun. And like myself and Kieran on the road, we had the best laugh ever. I swear to God, it was one of the best times of my life. You know, myself, Kieran and James Blenner Hassett, the three of us on the road. And 
We travel the length and breadth doing small folk clubs and laughing, laughing our hearts out, you know. And the kids would come with us, you know, and, you know, they'd laugh and we just had great crack. And what happened was then when myself and Kieran, we had our album and then there was a track taken off that and a track taken off the Arcadia album that I had been involved in and placed on the album that came out that was phenomenal success, which was Woman's Heart. So, and all of a sudden then our lives changed dramatically. And I don't know what happened after. That was early Two. or mid nineties, was it? That that would have been ninety, probably ninety one or ninety two, when the yeah. woman's heart came out. Yeah, and that was huge. Oh my god, it was, and it still seemingly is the biggest ever selling album that came out of Ireland, even beyond you two. That's the truth, God. Millions it sold, you know. So, so what that did was, it launched all of our careers. You know, all the women who were involved in that. Throughout the nineties, so Eleanor McAvoy was on. It was myself, Mary, Eleanor, uh, Maura O'Connell, uh, Sharon Shannon, and Dolores Keane. Six six women, and as I say, we didn't go into the studio, except for Mary and Eleanor did. They recorded the song "A Woman's Heart." That was the only song that was recorded for that album. The rest were just taken off all our other albums, and placed because Paul O'Reilly, who worked, who who ran Dara Records, he was always making compilations. You know, that's what he did. He loved it. He loved putting all different people on together. So was this his idea? This was, well, it was him and yeah. Joe, yeah. Joe, his brother, who's Mary's husband. Right, yeah. So the two of them ran Dara Records and the two of them came up with this idea and they just put this album out and before we knew it, all hell broke loose. Yeah. And it was around the time where, Mary, you know, the president, Mary Robbins, it was a real women's, it was a kind of a big surge of yeah. kind of women starting to kind of come together and I don't know what it was. It was just a very strong woman's energy in Ireland at that time. And um, we were just part of it. It was a movement and we were just part of it and we were the kind of, you know, the artists or the, the, the performers or whatever and we were all women. And... It was an amazing, and we went on tour, and we had to laugh. Again, it was just all great crack. It was like, oh my God, you know? I mean, it was really fun, you know? And then I got offered my own record deal, which I nearly didn't take because I didn't, again, it was a lack of self-belief. And, you know, I was, they offered me a record deal, my own solo record deal. And I had, myself and Kieran had gone our separate ways, and I thought, I couldn't do it without Kieran. How am I going to do it? Who's going to help me, you know? Um, and it was actually Mary who said, sure, look, I should make it and what's the worst that can happen? You know, and I thought, yeah, sure, look, even if I make it and I'd be able to show me grandchildren that I once I made an album. That's exactly what was in my head. There was a time back in the early, I was imagining myself sitting with grandchildren, telling them about the time I made the album. And um, so I released this album and it went to number one for 10 weeks in Ireland. And it just... I, Honest to God, it was just... And I was winning awards left, right and centre. And I didn't know what hit me. Were you I, in your late 20s? What, no, I was in my early 30s. Early 30s, yeah. mm -hmm. I didn't know what hit me. I really didn't know what hit me. I swear to God, to this day, even when I think back on it, it was like a dream. It really was like a dream because... And all the time, there's this little voice in my head saying, they're going to find out that you're not really that good. Yeah, imposter syndrome. You're, yeah. Again, I, I refer back to that Bruce Springsteen interview. He was yeah. talking about, he gets it. And he's after paying, like playing to 80,000 in Dublin and he can sell out all over the world. Yeah. And, and yeah. then he talked about even being suicidal in the middle oh, yeah. of it all. Yeah, yeah. And that's sometimes people are looking in at celebrities yeah. or people yeah. doing very well for themselves. Yeah. And it's that thing that you never know what's going on. You in, don't inside. know and never judge. Yeah. Never judge people, you know. That's the one thing that, because we don't know what it's like, you know, in anybody's skin. And for me, I would people would have looked at my life and said, oh, my God, she's riding on the crest of a wave. And inside I was just dying. I swear to God, I was dying. Yeah. That was when, that's when it peaked. That's when my depression started really badly. Because I kept thinking, how can I, how can I sustain this? You know, and people think I'm this, but I'm actually this. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually this and they think I'm that. You I, know? I, I was looking at the term uh, status anxiety yesterday when I was reading something. And it, it's that notion that you, you're seen to be this. And if you were to reveal the truth, you may lose the perceived status, which is yeah. what people want. But hopefully we're getting to a stage now where you can be both. You can still have your status, but mm. your vulnerability as well. Exactly. You know, and the, and the reality is... I'll tell you what I learned and what is pure freedom 
is, and I hope I'm allowed to say a little curse here, but I don't care, I don't give a shit what people think of me anymore. I really don't, and I really mean that. Whereas at one time, I would have been so stuck in that feeling of what are people going to think? It was just, and I think now it's some kind of like toxic shame or something that we carry, you know, that we feel we have to live up to this kind of expectation of what people or how people perceive us. Or maybe we can't live up to our own expectations. I really don't know. But, you know, and I've learned now that really I am who I am, you know, and this is it. This is just it. And if people like me, they like me, but not everybody's going to like me. You know, and not everybody's going to like my music. And not everybody's going to like what I stand for or what I believe in. You know, of course. And they have every right. It's not possible. It's, it's not, not possible. Yeah. And they have every right to feel that and to, to not agree with me and not agree with what I believe in or not like my music or anything like that. Whereas I used to think, is, oh, everybody has to like me or else I'm a failure. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, and I realised, you know, and I learned to many different ways um, that that's what freedom is is not caring what people think of you and just being you and just being and accepting yourself for, for yourself you know and I, since since I've started embarked on that journey I found unbelievable freedom you know and even running here for the Shannon like you know I knew that people were going to go I got to love her you know <laughs> do you know what I mean like there was this thing of some people were kind of saying who like what is she thinking? When well, where are they saying it? Or were you imagining they were saying it? Well, no, I do know that people were saying it. And I knew people would say it. Okay. You know, and, and these people now, what would they be a particular <laughs> type of people? or well, people that would have been close to me, that I would okay. have, who I love, right, and yeah, they yeah. love me, you know. But do they think you're a wee bit, you know, your one's a bit daft anyway. That's I, what she does. Well, she's running for the Shannon. Like, yeah. what would she know about politics? Right, right. No, and... Yeah. I can understand that. Like, yeah, what does yeah. she know about politics? You know, and in a way, there was, I had that voice too, but I kept challenging it, going, actually, you do, you don't need to know about politics to do, to get in there and be passionate about the issues that you're passionate about. Yeah. If you know what yeah. I mean. Well, I do, because ultimately, democracy is ruled by the people for the people. Exactly. So if you're not the people, then who's. Exactly. Who's and I'm working in yeah. the community. I mean, I had set up the Rise Foundation. I'm working, you know. Exactly, yeah. So, like, I felt I've every right to be in there. And I felt this unbelievable urge to be the voice for people who didn't have a voice and who don't have a voice. And that's what drives me. And I know what that feels like, you know? Yeah, I know yeah. what that feels like to to not have a voice and not being able to verbalise what's going on for me. So that's why, and now I can, now I can verbalise what's going on for me, but not only can I do that, I can also verbalise what's going on for other people. And for me, that's why, that's what has really driven me to, to run in the Shannon. Was there a defining moment or was it this... No, it was a very... kind of a non-growing kind of, uh, you know, feeling of frustration, I suppose, you know, that of... of I know it very well. <laughs> you know, that yeah. feeling of frustration of yeah. what in the name of God is going on? Like, why yeah. are there people homeless in this day and age? Yeah. Why are people struggling with depression? Why is there no not enough supports out there for people who have alcohol, drug, gambling issues? Why? Why is there not enough supports out there for their families? But, but, like, it's an injustice. And I thought, you know, and no matter how much I would try and work within the communities with families, for example, or those who were in addiction or those with mental health and support people, it needed to, it needs to come from the top, you know, and it needs to come from in here, you know, and we all know it. We all know it. And, you know... I just felt I had to get in here and just start talking about it and really trying to work towards change around it. And that's why I decided to run for the Shannon. And it's daunting because you come into somewhere like here and it is a different language, you know, and you have to learn the language. You have to learn the understanding of legislation and motions and order of business and things like that. You know, they were all new to me. But I'm, I'm good at learning you know even the the way you go to run for the Shannon isn't simple by no, any means no. that's intimidating yeah 
Or it could be. But you see, I was, I love now a challenge. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I thought, and I genuinely thought, I'm going to run for this and I probably won't get in, but I learn. What can I learn from it? And I learn for the next time. So that's what I did. And I, you know, I picked people's brains. I set up meetings with people who, you know, would have a good understanding of it. And they talked me through the process. And, you know, I found that very helpful, you know. Um, and that, that's what happened. That's what I did. And I just followed what, what, I, was, what I was advised to do, you know. And it was a, it was a very interesting uh, journey. It was really interesting. And it was just me and Michael Conlon. Michael Conlon helped me. He's 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 CEO of Sicta. He tweeted me. He said, "I hear you're running." I said, "Jason, I'll help you." And I I'd only met Michael once. He said, "This is something I'd love to help you with," you know. So myself and Michael and Andrea Smith. Um, Andrea Smith helped me as well, um, and of course Brian. Brian, my husband, helped and Emma. You know. So we there was like. There was like six of us, five of us. I don't know how many I'm after saying there, but right. There was enough of us sitting around a table around, you know, and going, how are we going to do this? And picking people's brains and what do we do now? What do we do now? And ringing up people and talking to people and yeah. from all parties. And none of these say. people you mentioned, uh, to my knowledge, they're not traditional operators. No, I mean... They're Michael, as far as I know, is a Michael community is person. Community works in yeah, the Yeah, yeah, so community. these aren't old establishment heads to... No in. experience so in politics. So you are coming to hack the system from the ground. Yeah, no experience in politics. So, you know... Um, just fantastic, fantastic. I mean, it was just a fantastic experience. And I was advised to camp to, to canvas all of the independents first. And that's what I did. So I went canvassing all the independent councillors. And then, then I went to some of the Fianna Fáil people. Then I went to some of the Fianna Gael people. Then I went to people before profit and the triple A's and, and Sinn Féin. And what went was that experience like? Ah, oh, it was great. It was brilliant. Were you like phoning them or visiting phoning them? Phoning and calling, you know, like phoning right. and trying to make. So if I yeah. was doing a gig down in um, Tipperary, yeah, yeah. I'd ring all the independent councillors down there and you wouldn't get them all to meet you to be gone, you know, some of them would. But yeah. so there was like people like Andy Maloney, who comes from Care, who's an independent county councillor. Andy Maloney is one of these amazing people. And there's loads of county councillors like this who just dedicate their lives to the community. Amazing people, you know. Um, and so I'd go down and I'd ring and he'd say, yeah, come down, sure, we're just about to go on a on a 5K run for the local something, something, right? The local nursing home, actually. So I went down and I met with Andy and then he introduced me to all of the, the old women in the nursing home and to the people running the nursing home. And, you know, and it was got photograph taken and, you know, so it's meeting people like that and, and, and people from... Cove, Claire Cullinan and you know and Kieran, who was a he's an independent county councillor as well and just brilliant people I mean really brilliant I, I have to tell you what I was what I was amazed at was these amazing people county councillors that I met and city councillors Dublin city councillors great people the work that they do is just unbelievable and I think that was a huge eye opener for me and they get very little reward apart from just fulfilment, you know. So it was a great experience. I loved every minute of it. Did you encounter uh, much opposition or any opposition? No, funnily enough. I mean, of course you meet people who'd say, I can't give you my vote because I have to give it to my party. Do you know what I mean? So, of course, and, and I really appreciated their honesty. Do you know, um, listen, you know, but I might give you third or fourth, you know, or fifth maybe. You know, or I'll give you something, you know. Um, but everybody was lovely. And what was it like then when you actually won the seat? Oh, God, Rory, I have to tell you, that was one of the most amazing... It was better, like... It was the best feeling in the world. I've, I've won, and I'm not saying this from an ego place, right, where I've won awards from my music and you know, Ireland's Entertainer of the Year and, you know, all of these kind of awards, um, the, the Irma Award and loads of different awards. But that day, myself and Michael came in to Leinster House and it was about 10 o'clock in the morning and it was really exciting to be part of this experience. And we were sitting with these politicians that 
you know, I would have look, looked at, oh, there's so-and-so and there's so-and-so. Look at him and look at him. You know what I mean? People you see on the telly, you're like in awe, right? No matter what party they were from, I was in awe of them all. And I was actually nearly so in awe of them that I was nearly afraid to say hello to them. Do you know that way? You're kind of going, oh, there's your man. You know, you're just so in awe of all of these politicians. So I had this feeling that, you know, a strong feeling that I was going to be out of Leinster House and back in the Rise office and back to normal by half three, maybe four. And I was thinking that would be a good day because that means I would have gotten a good few votes. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, but if I'm out by 12, I'll be mortified, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so like, but the day that, the, what happens when you're when you're um, getting elected in, in here in, for the Shannon, right, is they put your first preference votes in front of you. Okay, so they keep coming over. There's about 12, you know, people who staff members so when you get first preference vote they just put that ballot paper in front of you but they just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and myself and Michael were gone and I was nearly like I was absolutely in shock and here was Michael he was digging me you know the two of us were sitting there and we got 75,000 first votes right now one ballot paper is a thousand okay so one vote is a thousand so we got 75, which was unbelievable for firstly, a woman independent. I don't know if that's ever happened before because... It's almost unheard of for a first time candidate. Absolutely. In and particularly yeah. independent. Yeah. Um, and a woman, <clears throat> you know, because I only needed 116. So I got 75 and that was really shocking, to be honest with you. Um, and then people were, at that point, even though I needed 116, people were coming up to me saying, you've done it, you're elected. And I was going, I believe it when I see it. You know, because I didn't know how many second preferences I got. Now, I had gotten loads of, I had asked Sinn Féin to give me their second preference votes and I'd asked them to give me some of their first preference votes. But they, they gave another, they had another, somebody else um, that they had, they had another candidate that they were giving their first preference votes to as well. So I got some first preference votes, but I got some loads of independent votes. They were the ones who got me over the line. And I got loads of people before profit votes as well. And they were very kind. They gave me first preference votes and I'm deeply grateful to them as well. So, and th then I had some Fianna Fáil votes, which probably first preference, but they probably, I shouldn't be squealing on them because they probably shouldn't have been giving me their first preference yeah. votes. Well, you're <laughs> not them, you know, yeah. <laughs> but they probably shouldn't. And I might have even got yeah. one or two Fianna Gael, but yeah. I'm not sure about that. But um, yeah. so it was a good, you know, it was a good, it was just really exciting. So when I, when I got elected, they, they, I mean, they didn't, I didn't get elected till later on that night. And I have to tell you, it was the best feeling in the world, best feeling in the world, because I was not expecting it. And I couldn't believe it. And all I kept thinking about was my parents, my father and my mother and how proud they would have been. And of course, my family were all, you know, because they didn't think I'd do it. I didn't think I'd do it. How would they think I would do it? Do you know what I mean? So they were all, everybody was texting me because they were all watching it online, you know. And they were, I was just getting hundreds and hundreds of texts, you know. So it was the best feeling in the world, you know. And... Um, I am so grateful to everybody that voted for me. I really am. And I I really, when I got in here, when I'm still in here now, but I feel I won't let them down, you know? I will really work hard to, and I intend to make change. And I might be only here for two years. I hope I'm not. I hope I get a bit more time because you do need a bit of time in here to make change. Um, I'm in a great group, the civil engagement group. Um, amazing people who are from civil society Alice Mary Higgins amazing woman Lynn Ruan John Dolan Colette Kelleher Grace um, O'Sullivan Grace is in the Green Party so there's six of us that work together and we all come from social justice in a way with that background you know and we all fought on to fight and already you know um Alice Mary was leading on the CETA motion and she got it passed, you know, and already... This is the Canadian-Europe yeah, uh, trade, trade agreement. agreement. So that was, that, was, that was a first for something like that to have for it to happen in the Shannad. It was actually one of the first votes in Europe because yeah. most parliaments are, are 
legislators didn't get any options. Absolutely. Yeah. But that was a first for something like that to happen in, in the Shannon was off the Richter scale. I mean, people were going, oh, this group mean business. Yeah. You know I, what I, I mean? I remember seeing that. There was, there was a shout out of kind of joy after. Oh, we were it? screaming hysterically. Yeah. It was the best feeling in the world that we'd won because you don't, you don't win those votes unless you're in government. You know what I mean? Always the government win. So that was a first for somebody who are not the government, because the government were voting, uh, you know, uh, the other way. So um, that was really freaky. What happened was Fianna Fáil abstained. But anyway, that's just, we're getting into politics at the last minute, which was brilliant. That sense of justice, um, so how much of that has come from your own personal journey and how much from your family? Did Was there a sense from your mother or your father or people growing up to you, was there somebody that had a real strong voice yeah. of justice? Yeah, well, I mean, my father, as I say, came from Rattlin Island, um, you know, and I suppose he would have felt a sense of, um, and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have spoke about it, but it was just an energy um, around, you know, I suppose the whole civil rights that would have happened, you know, in the 60s and 70s around the, the nationalist issue and how nationalists, there was an injustice there. Um, and I think even though he wouldn't have spoken about it, he was a, he was a real pacifist, a very strong pacifist. So he wasn't actually part of the civil rights movement or No, March but he would have been very, he would have been impacted by the injustice of it. You would have seen the sadness, you would have seen it as he watched it on television, living in Dublin, you know. Um, and I would have picked up on that, I suppose. That, that that was one of the first things for me that I would have remembered. Going up to Rattlin Island and, you know, and talking to the people up there. But my, our eldest brother, Shay, would have had a great sense of injustice also um, and would have been a great, and still is, you know. He would have had a great, um, I suppose, uh, you know, he, he would have had a great sense from 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 myself and particularly my brother Martin both of us would have looked up to Shay and we would have picked up on it you know the fact that he had a great sense of injustice and he would have been out fighting and marching and all those kind of things and we looked at him nearly as a fatherly figure he would have been a lot older than us you know so he would have been he had it would have had an influence on us definitely so but I don't know I mean for me I just from a very young age I just didn't like to see injustice so I was always at the marches and by the time I was 17, 18 you know I'd be there marching and you know the nuclear power of Cairnsor Point and, you know that's all before your time but you know what I mean it was like well it is but let me tell you I was at the 25th anniversary of Cairnsor Point uh, right. down in Wexford and uh, it was very important for me because I was, would have been in my early t- mid early to mid 20s when I went to that anniversary and I met mm. people from all around the world and people that had campaigned at the time and it it reminded me that there were people who stood up at a point in time namely I think really around 78 mm-hmm. right there yeah that, that's that right, kind of period and, mm-hmm. and that they actually stopped nuclear power coming they did, to yeah. Ireland they did now we still import it and there's other issues mm. there but we are one of the only nuclear free countries in yeah. Europe yeah. which is huge <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. And I was down there at that festival, you know. But that was that was probably one of the first things I would have been involved in. And there's just loads of other things all, all the way up. And, you know, I, I, I still... Um, I still get that sense of frustration around injustice. And it drives me mad. I can't handle it sometimes. <laughs> and so, like, there, there are real limitations as to what the yeah. Shannon can achieve and what a senator can achieve. So... Do you feel even more frustrated now that you're in here? No, because I do feel I'm I'm work. I mean, at least I feel I'm working on the issues. Like you know, I am really working hard on the alcohol bill, and the alcohol issue in this country. And when I started to, when I was when I was in my own recovery, and all of a sudden I realised, you know, when you're in your own recovery from alcohol, um, and you're looking around you this amazing country that we have, this beautiful, great, fantastic country with the most amazing people. And everywhere you look, people are getting locked. And when you're in that kind of place of almost being awake or something, or you're waking up out of, 
you know, a dark place and you're just looking around you and you go everywhere. If you want to go out for a night out, it's always alcohol related. If you want to hang out with people, it's alcohol related. If you want to, you know, if you're going to a wedding, it's alcohol related. If you go to a funeral, it's alcohol related. If you go to a child's holy communion, it's alcohol related. I mean, and then I started to work as a therapist in the Rutland Treatment Centre. I went back to college after my mother passed away and I, I studied to be a therapist. I worked, uh, this is in the early 2000s, and I worked in the Rutland Treatment Centre and I loved working there, you know, and I was working with young people who were trying to give up alcohol and like their biggest fear was walking out the gates into an alcohol fueled society where they were going to be completely isolated and alone because that's what their mates all do every weekend. It's going to piss. So, you know, what's wrong? Like, well, there's something wrong with that picture. You know, you go to America and you, you have, you go for a meal with people or you go to somebody's house for dinner and there's one bottle of wine brought out for the whole night and that was a shock to me when I saw that and I'm not, I wasn't a drinker I was expecting you know the bottles to come out because that's what happens here there's bottles of wine you know that's what I'm familiar with in Ireland over there they've one bottle of wine and then they all sit around drink tea you know and chat and have a really lovely night you know so like why 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 is there so much alcohol in Ireland do you think it's the a thousand dollar question really isn't it I mean there's so many different reasons I um, I um, there's a great man um, called Gareth O'Connor Professor Gareth O'Connor who was um, the, the president of the Betty Ford Institute and he wrote a great piece called I think it's called Malignant Shame and Ireland's Alcohol Culture or something something to that 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 kind of and um, it, it, he talks about how we carry malignant shame down to the generations from way 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 back you know and how in our it's in our it's almost in our soul where this shame drives us so it's and then it's fueled by alcohol you know shame that we're not good enough shame that we're not good enough shame that we're <laughs> you know you know, and you can go back down so to many, many generations. To some extent, that not that you want, to, you know, have a singular focus on this, mm. but like if you look at post-colonial uh, cultures mm. around the world, I have noticed mm. alcohol issues amongst Maori people in New Zealand, yeah. amongst Aboriginal people yeah. in Australia, amongst First Nations people in Canada. Yeah. And are we essentially a tribal people that it's it's got in on us over hundreds of years? I think it plays a role. I definitely think, I, I believe, it's only my own personal opinion, I do think it plays a role. Um, and it's in our souls almost, if you know what I mean, this, this unhealthy relationship with alcohol that we as a nation have. And, you know, we carry it, you know, and it... It can't passes on down to the generations. That is the reality, you know. And until we do something to change that or break that cycle, um, and we have to take that responsibility. We all individually have to take on that responsibility to break that cycle. But we also, it also needs to come from the top also, from the governing bodies, you know. And that's what's really important and I really genuinely believe that the only way to do that is through the alcohol bill that that's why I'm here is to get this alcohol it's a start it's not the look at it's not the whole answer to everything and this is a bill that's facing huge opposition can yeah. you talk to me about some of the opposition you've encountered and well the reality is is that you know um, the alcohol bill I think could and it will I'm not saying could it will work towards change in our culture and our unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Um, and I think it's vital that we get it through and passed and not watered down. But the problem is, is that the alcohol industry are extremely powerful, extremely powerful. And I would not have known how powerful until I've come in here and I've seen the lobbying, the amount of lobbying that they've done, how they can um, really work their magic or something I don't know what it is but I suppose money is power isn't it power is money and 
they have it and they can do it and they have people in here lobbying all of the time. And the reality is, is that the public health alcohol bill and bearing in mind that the first two words are public health, this is about changing lives. This is about saving lives. Three people a day in this country die of our wonderful people, three people a day are dying from a, from a, an alcohol-related uh, issue, whether it be through accident, whether it be through liver failure, whether it be through alcohol-related cancer or heart disease. Um, that's, that's shocking numbers. That's like a thousand a year. It's shocking to think that a thousand of our wonderful people are dying from an alcohol-related, you know, issue. And... And then we have like, you know, 1,500 people in this country a day, you know, are taking up hospital beds with alcohol harm. And part of the driving force around this seems to be advertising and marketing, which I think... The yeah, the alcohol address. bill is around alcohol marketing, minimum unit pricing, labelling, mm. um, and, and, you know, and it's really, and obviously, uh, product separation in mm. the shops. Because it's, it's still it's it's a kind of it seems to me that it's even a modest bill because it still doesn't even tackle sponsorship in sport. No. So for instance, I've been watching a lot of rugby and like the rugby is saturated with alcohol yeah. advertising now. So you've got it feels to me that they're grooming young people and sports yeah. fans. Yeah. To I even I noticed on Twitter after Ireland beat the All Blacks that um, one of the major drinks companies they were in on the game and. We can look at that tweet as just a bit of crack, but it's clear that they want to associate their product exactly. with our culture. Yeah. And those sportsmen weren't necessarily going out on the beard the night before the match. And no, the sure heroes. Yeah. The heroes are yeah. not drinkers. Then again, I did see a photo of one of the sports guys holding up a pint fairly mm. quickly after the match. And maybe there's a responsibility there for them to understand mm -hmm. their role as role models. Yeah. Uh, however... Maybe then we could be seen as too pious and yeah. sure what's wrong. And I with think, and points. I think, and yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, obviously we have to be careful around all of that. But in saying that, careful, three people a day, you know, if that was road crashes, you know, we know and remember that suicide, fifty over fifty percent of people who die by suicide, alcohol is related. So I mean. That, that we're talking about public health issue here. We're talking about people's lives. We're not... And I understand that the, the drinks industry are coming from a place of, you know, business, jobs, you know, profit, all of that kind of stuff. But we're, we want to save lives. And I just don't... I just can't bear to think that... I, I suppose for me, I can't get my head around that injustice of how could they... How can they not see it? How can they not see that this is impacting people's lives? So that's what's shocking to me. Where is their humanity? You know, where is their humanity? Why are they not worried about three people a day dying from an alcohol-related issue? Where, where, where is their conscience? That's what I can't get my head around. So there we back to the injustice piece, you yeah, know? Well, when the God is money. Which, which is just disgraceful. And I can't... I worry sometimes about this lovely country of ours in the sense that I worry about them putting profits before our people and that's very worrying how do you stay grounded in all of this because it's a lot to take on because you have your work with the rise foundation so you're still at the cold face mm. and you presumably have people phoning you at different hours of the day looking for personal support different things and then you're fighting the big fights so where where is you in all of this how do you stay happy healthy grounded well, don't get me wrong, I do feel a little bit tired at times, but I do have a strong, I suppose this might sound really strange, but I have a good, strong sense of spirituality. Um, and I, that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, religious, you know what I mean? Um, I have a very strong sense of, for me, and this would have come from my own recovery. Um, I do believe that my addiction or my depression was a soul sickness and is a soul sickness. And that until I was able to start looking after my spirit and doing things for my spirit, it was only going to be stronger again. And that's really, that's really what I'm very conscious of. Um, my body gets tired, but once my spirit is strong, um, I think I'm going to be all right. But I, I do have to mind it. Um, I have to make sure that I still have a good, strong sense of connection um, with my spirit. I hope that makes sense. Um, strong sense of, for me, I have a higher power in my life. Um, 
I have to work on that on a daily basis. Uh, you know, I just bring, when I'm walking into work or at some point during the day, I just say, look, give me a little hand here. Give me a bit of strength. And I'm able to tap into that. You know, I very much keep everything in the moment. I really, really work hard on keeping things in the now. And I don't have to work. I don't think about, you know, anything. You know, I don't get into anxiety. Sometimes I do. But I, I suppose I get anxious about not being able to live up to, you know, delivering what I want to deliver around injustice. Uh, but I, I, I do bring, bring it back to keeping it in the moment. So I suppose there are the things I do. I like walking. I like listening to music. I like spending time with my, my family, you know, my dog, my dogs, um, my husband, obviously, you know, my lovely husband. And there are things I like to do. Um, uh, but I do love being, I love, I love working. I love being able to give back. And that's why I'm here. I want to give back. And I want to, when I'm on my deathbed, I want to say I did my best. That's all I want to do. I did my best. It's been a pleasure, Francis. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rory. Good talk. Thank you for listening to the Love and Courage podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd really love if you could subscribe to the podcast, rate it and review it and spread the word on social media and wherever you can. While I love doing these interviews, they take a lot of time and effort in research, production, post-production and publicity, and there are some costs involved. If you would like to chip in and help the podcast grow, it would be really appreciated. All contributions welcome and monthly patrons can receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. And this support helps me to help others in the community in my day-to-day work. My sincere thanks to all of you who have already supported in so many different ways. Also, just to say, I sometimes take on social change media, communications campaigns and strategic projects and do talks and presentations, workshops and schools and colleges community centres and at conferences. Topics range from mental health and personal development to youth and community empowerment, leadership, activism and social innovation. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, please let me know. So to get in touch, to offer feedback or suggestions or to make a financial contribution right now, log on to loveandcourage.org or send me an email to podcast at loveandcourage.org. Thank you so much for all your support. Until next time, here's to you, to all of us and to having the courage to create big change in our lives and in the world around us.